LibriVox.org. The City of God by St. Augustine of Hippo, Book 21, Chapter 7. Why, then, cannot God effect both that the bodies of the dead shall rise, and that the bodies of the damned shall be in torment in everlasting fire? God, who made the world full of countless miracles in sky, earth, air, and waters, while itself is a miracle unquestionably greater and more admirable than all the marvels it is filled with. But those with whom, or against whom, we are arguing, who believe both that there is a God who made the world, and that there are gods created by him, who administer the world's laws as his vice-regents, our adversaries, I say, who so far from denying emphatically, assert that there are powers in the world which effect marvellous results, whether of their own accord, or because they are invoked by some rite or prayer, or in some magical way, when we lay before them the wonderful properties of other things which are neither rational animals nor rational spirits, but such material objects as those we have just cited, are in the habit of replying, This is their natural property, their nature, these are the powers naturally belonging to them. Thus the whole reason why Agrigentine salt dissolves in fire and crackles in water is that this is its nature. Yet this seems rather contrary to nature, which has given not to fire but to water the power of melting salt, and the power of scorching it not to water but to fire. But this, they say, is the natural property of this salt to show effects contrary to these. The same reason, therefore, is assigned to account for that Garamantian fountain, of which one and the same runlet is chill by day and boiling by night, so that in either extreme it cannot be touched. So also of that other fountain which, though it is cold to the touch, and though it, like other fountains, extinguishes a lighted torch, yet unlike other fountains, and in a surprising manner, kindles an extinguished torch. So of the asbestos stone, which, though it has no heat of its own, yet when kindled by fire applied to it, cannot be extinguished. And so of the rest, which I am weary of reciting, and in which, though there seems to be an extraordinary property contrary to nature, yet no other reason is given for them than this, that this is their nature." a brief reason truly, and, I own, a satisfactory reply. But, since God is the author of all natures, how is it that our adversaries, when they refuse to believe what we affirm on the ground that it is impossible, are unwilling to accept from us a better explanation than their own, namely that this is the will of Almighty God, for certainly he is called Almighty only because he is mighty to do all he will. He who was able to create so many marvels, not only unknown, but very well ascertained, as I have been showing, and which, were they not under our own observation, or reported by recent and credible witnesses, would certainly be pronounced impossible. For as for those marvels which have no other testimony than the writers in whose books we read them, and who wrote without being divinely instructed, and are therefore liable to human error, we cannot justly blame any one who declines to believe them. For my own part, I do not wish all the marvels I have cited to be rashly accepted, for I do not myself believe them implicitly, save those which have either come under my own observation, or which any one can readily verify, such as the lime which is heated by water and cooled by oil, the magnet which by its mysterious and insensible suction attracts the iron, but has no effect on a straw, the peacock's flesh which triumphs over the corruption from which not the flesh of Plato is exempt, the chaff so chilling that it prevents snow from melting, so heating that it forces apples to ripen, the glowing fire which, in accordance with its glowing appearance, whitens the stones it bakes, while, contrary to its glowing appearance, it begrimes most things it burns, 
just as dirty stains are made by oil, however pure it be, and as the lines drawn by white silver are black. The charcoal, too, which by the action of fire is so completely changed from its original, that a finely mocked piece of wood becomes hideous, the tuff becomes brittle, the decaying incorruptible. Some of these things I know in common with many other persons, some of them in common with all men, and there are many others which I have not room to insert in this book. But of those which I have cited, though I have not myself seen, but only read about them, I have been unable to find trustworthy witnesses from whom I could ascertain whether they are facts, except in the case of that fountain in which burning torches are extinguished, and extinguished torches lit, and of the apples of Sodom, which are ripe to appearance, but are filled with dust." And indeed I have not met with any who said that they had seen that fountain in Epirus, but with some who knew there was a similar fountain in Gaul, not far from Grenoble. The fruit of the trees of Sodom, however, is not only spoken of in books worthy of credit, but so many persons say that they have seen it, that I cannot doubt the fact. But the rest of the prodigies I receive without definitely affirming or denying them, and I have cited them because I read them in the authors of our adversaries, and that I might prove how many things many among themselves believe, because they are written in the works of their own literary men, though no rational explanation of them is given, and yet they scorn to believe us when we assert that Almighty God will do what is beyond their experience and observation and this they do even though we assign a reason for his work. For what better and stronger reason for such things can be given than to say that the Almighty is able to bring them to pass and will bring them to pass, having predicted them in those books in which many other marvels which have already come to pass were predicted? Those things which are regarded as impossible will be accomplished according to the word, and by the power of that God who predicted and effected that the incredulous nations should believe incredible wonders. Chapter 8 but if they reply that their reason for not believing us when we say that human bodies will always burn and yet never die, is that the nature of human bodies is known to be quite otherwise constituted, if they say that for this miracle we cannot give the reason which was valid in the case of those natural miracles, namely that this is the natural property, the nature of the thing, for we know that this is not the nature of human flesh, we find our answer in the sacred writings that even this human flesh was constituted in one fashion before there was sin, was constituted in fact so that it could not die, and in another fashion after sin, being made such as we see it in this miserable state of mortality, unable to retain enduring life. And so in the resurrection of the dead shall it be constituted differently from its present well-known condition. But as they do not believe these writings of ours, in which we read what nature man had in paradise, and how remote he was from the necessity of death, and indeed if they did believe them, we should of course have little trouble in debating with them the future punishment of the damned, we must produce from the writings of their own most learned authorities some instances to show that it is possible for a thing to become different from what it was formerly known characteristically to be. From the book of Marcus Varro, entitled Of the Race of the Roman People, I cite word for word the following instance. There occurred a remarkable celestial portent, for Castor records that in the brilliant star Venus, called Vesperugo by Plautus, and the lovely Hesperus by Homer, there occurred so strange a prodigy that it changed its color, size, form, course, which never happened before nor since. Adrastus of Sisychus and Dion of Naples, famous mathematicians, said that this occurred in the reign of Augages. So great an author as Varro would certainly not have called this a portent, had it not seemed to be contrary to nature. For we say that all portents are contrary to nature, but they are not so. 
For how is that contrary to nature which happens by the will of God, since the will of so mighty a creator is certainly the nature of each created thing? A portent, therefore, happens not contrary to nature, but contrary to what we know as nature. But who can number the multitude of portents recorded in profane histories? Let us then at present fix our attention on this one only which concerns the matter in hand. What is there so arranged by the author of the nature of heaven and earth as the exactly ordered course of the stars? What is there established by laws so sure and inflexible? And yet, when it pleased him, who with sovereignty and supreme power regulates all he has created, a star conspicuous among the rest, by its size and splendor, changed its color, size, form, and, most wonderful of all, the order and law of its course. Certainly that phenomenon disturbed the canons of the astronomers, if there were any then, by which they tabulate, as by unerring computation, the past and future movements of the stars, so as to take upon them to affirm that this which happened to the morning star, Venus, never happened before nor since. But we read in the divine books that even the sun itself stood still when a holy man, Joshua, the son of Nun, had begged this from God until victory should finish the battle he had begun, and that it even went back that the promise of fifteen years added to the life of King Hezekiah might be sealed by this additional prodigy. But these miracles, which were vouchsafed to the merits of holy men, even when our adversaries believe them, they attribute to the magical arts. So Virgil, in the lines I quoted above, ascribes to magic the power to turn rivers backward to their source, and make the stars forget their course. For in our sacred books we read that this also happened, that a river turned backward, was stayed above while the lower part flowed on, when the people passed over under the above-mentioned leader, Joshua the son of Nun. And also when Elias the prophet crossed, and afterwards when his disciple Elisha passed through it. And we have just mentioned how, in the case of King Hezekiah, the greatest of the stars forgot its course. But what happened to Venus, according to Varro, was not said by him to have happened in answer to any man's prayer. Let not the skeptics then benight themselves in this knowledge of the nature of things, as if divine power cannot bring to pass in an object anything else than what their own experience has shown them to be in its nature. Even the very things which are most commonly known as natural would not be less wonderful nor less effectual to excite surprise in all who beheld them if men were not accustomed to admire nothing but what is rare. For who that thoughtfully observes the countless multitude of men and their similarity of nature can fail to remark with surprise and admiration the individuality of each man's appearance, suggesting to us, as it does, that unless men were like one another, they would not be distinguished from the rest of the animals, while unless, on the other hand, they were unlike, they could not be distinguished from one another, so that those whom we declare to be like we also find to be unlike. And the unlikeness is the more wonderful consideration of the two, for a common nature seems rather to require similarity. And yet, because the very rarity of things is that which makes them wonderful, we are filled with much greater wonder when we are introduced to two men so like, that we either always or frequently mistake in endeavoring to distinguish between them. But possibly, though Varro is a heathen historian and a very learned one, they may disbelieve that what I have cited from him truly occurred, or they may say the example is invalid because the star did not for any length of time continue to follow its new course, but return to its ordinary orbit. There is, then, another phenomenon at present open to their observation, and which, in my opinion, ought to be sufficient to convince them that though they have observed and ascertained some natural law, they ought not on that account to prescribe to God, as if he could not change and turn it into something very different from what they have observed. 
The land of Sodom was not always as it now is, but once it had the appearance of other lands, and enjoyed equal, if not richer, fertility. For in the divine narrative it was compared to the paradise of God. But after it was touched by fire from heaven, as even pagan history testifies, and as is now witnessed by those who visit the spot, it became unnaturally and horribly sooty in appearance, and its apples, under a deceitful appearance of ripeness, contain ashes within. Here is a thing which was of one kind, and is of another. You see how its nature was converted by the wonderful transmutation wrought by the Creator of all natures into so very disgusting a diversity, an alteration which after so long a time took place, and after so long a time still continues. As, therefore, it was not impossible to God to create such natures as he pleased, so it is not impossible to him to change these natures of his own creation into whatever he pleases, and thus spread abroad a multitude of those marvels which are called monsters, portents, prodigies, phenomena, and which, if I were minded to cite and record, what end would there be to this work? They say that they are called monsters because they demonstrate or signify something, portents because they portend something, and so forth. But let their diviners see how they are either deceived, or even when they do predict true things, it is because they are inspired by spirits who are intent upon entangling the minds of men, worthy indeed of such a fate, in the meshes of a hurtful curiosity, or how they light now and then upon some truth, because they make so many predictions. Yet for our part these things which happen contrary to nature, and are said to be contrary to nature, as the apostle, speaking after the manner of men, says that to graft the wild olive into the good olive, and to partake of its fatness, is contrary to nature, and are called monsters, phenomena, portents, prodigies, ought to demonstrate, portend, predict, that God will bring to pass what he has foretold regarding the bodies of men, no difficulty preventing him, no law of nature prescribing to him his limit. How he has foretold what he is to do, I think I have sufficiently shown in the preceding book, culling from the sacred scriptures both of the New and Old Testaments, not indeed all the passages that relate to this, but as many as I judged to suffice for this work. CHAPTER Nine. So then, what God by his prophet has said of the everlasting punishment of the damned shall come to pass, shall without fail come to pass, their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. In order to impress this upon us most forcibly, the Lord Jesus himself, when ordering us to cut off our members, meaning thereby those persons whom a man loves as the most useful members of his body, says, it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and their fire is not quenched. Similarly of the foot. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched so too of the eye. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye, than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. He did not shrink from using the same words three times over in one passage. And who is not terrified by this repetition, and by the threat of that punishment uttered so vehemently by the lips of the Lord himself? Now they who would refer both the fire and the worm to the spirit, and not to the body, affirm that the wicked who are separated from the kingdom of God shall be burned, as it were, by the anguish of a spirit repenting too late and fruitlessly, and they contend that fire is therefore not inappropriately used to express this burning torment, as when the apostle exclaims, Who is offended, and I burn not? The worm, too, they think, is to be similarly understood. 
For it is written, they say, As the moth consumes the garment, And the worm the wood, So does grief consume the heart of a man. But they who make no doubt That in that future punishment Both body and soul shall suffer, Affirm that the body shall be burned with fire, While the soul shall be, as it were, Gnawed by a worm of anguish. Though this view is more reasonable, for it is absurd to suppose that either body or soul will escape pain in the future punishment, yet for my own part I find it easier to understand both as referring to the body than to suppose that neither does, and I think that Scripture is silent regarding the spiritual pain of the damned, because, though not expressed, it is necessarily understood that in a body thus tormented the soul also is tortured with a fruitless repentance. For we read in the ancient scriptures, The vengeance of the flesh of the ungodly is fire and worms. It might have been more briefly said, The vengeance of the ungodly. Why then was it said, The flesh of the ungodly, Unless because both the fire and the worm Are to be the punishment of the flesh? Or if the object of the writer in saying the vengeance of the flesh was to indicate that this shall be the punishment of those who live after the flesh, for this leads to the second death, as the apostle intimated when he said, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die, let each one make his own choice, either assigning the fire to the body and the worm to the soul, the one figuratively, the other really, or assigning both really to the body. For I have already sufficiently made out that animals can live in the fire, in burning without being consumed, in pain without dying, by a miracle of the most omnipotent Creator, to whom no one can deny that this is possible, if he be not ignorant by whom has been made all that is wonderful in all nature." For it is God himself who has wrought all these miracles, great and small, in this world which I have mentioned, and incomparably more which I have omitted, and who has enclosed these marvels in this world, itself the greatest miracle of all. Let each man, then, choose which he will, whether he thinks that the worm is real and pertains to the body, or that spiritual things are meant by bodily representations, and that it belongs to the soul. But which of these is true will be more readily discovered by the facts themselves, when there shall be in the saints such knowledge as shall not require that their own experience teach them the nature of these punishments, but as shall, by its own fullness and perfection, suffice to instruct them in this matter. For now we know in part, until that which is perfect is come. Only this we believe about those future bodies, that they shall be such as shall certainly be pained by the fire. Chapter 10 Here arises the question, if the fire is not to be immaterial, analogous to the pain of the soul, but material, burning by contact, so that bodies may be tormented in it, how can evil spirits be punished in it? For it is undoubtedly the same fire which is to serve for the punishment of men and of devils, according to the words of Christ, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Unless perhaps, as learned men have thought, the devils have a kind of body made of that dense and humid air which we feel strikes us when the wind is blowing. And if this kind of substance could not be affected by fire, it could not burn when heated in the baths. For in order to burn, it is first burned, and affects other things, as itself is affected. But if any one maintains that the devils have no bodies, this is not a matter either to be laboriously investigated, or to be debated with keenness. For why may we not assert that even immaterial spirits may, in some extraordinary way, yet really be pained by the punishment of material fire, if the spirits of men, which also are certainly immaterial, are both now contained in material members of the body, and in the world to come shall be indissolubly united to their own bodies? 
Therefore, though the devils have no bodies, yet their spirits, that is, the devils themselves, shall be brought into thorough contact with the material fires, to be tormented by them. Not that the fires themselves with which they are brought into contact shall be animated by their connection with these spirits, and become animals composed of body and spirit, but, as I said, this junction will be effected in a wonderful and ineffable way, so that they shall receive pain from the fires, but give no life to them. And, in truth, this other mode of union, by which bodies and spirits are bound together and become animals, is thoroughly marvellous, and beyond the comprehension of man, though this it is which is man." I would indeed say that these spirits will burn without any body of their own, as that rich man was burning in hell, when he exclaimed, I am tormented in this flame, were I not aware that it is aptly said in reply, that that flame was of the same nature as the eyes he raised and fixed on Lazarus, as the tongue on which he entreated that a little cooling water might be dropped, or as the finger of Lazarus with which he asked that this might be done, all of which took place where souls exist without bodies. Thus, therefore, both that flame in which he burned and that drop he begged were immaterial, and resembled the visions of sleepers or persons in an ecstasy, to whom immaterial objects appear in a bodily form. For the man himself, who is in such a state, though it be in spirit only, not in body, yet sees himself so like to his own body, that he cannot discern any difference whatever. But that hell, which also is called a lake of fire and brimstone, will be material fire, and will torment the bodies of the damned, whether men or devils, the solid bodies of the one, aerial bodies of the others, or, if only men have bodies as well as souls, yet the evil spirits, though without bodies, shall be so connected with the bodily fires as to receive pain without imparting life. One fire certainly shall be the lot of both, for thus the truth has declared. CHAPTER eleven. Some, however, of those against whom we are defending the city of God, think it unjust that any man be doomed to an eternal punishment for sins which, no matter how great they were, were perpetrated in a brief space of time, as if any law ever regulated the duration of the punishment by the duration of the offense punished. Cicero tells us that the laws recognize eight kinds of penalty— damages, imprisonment, scourging, reparation, disgrace, exile, death, slavery. Is there any one of these which may be compressed into a brevity proportioned to the rapid commission of the offense, so that no longer time may be spent in its punishment than in its perpetration, unless perhaps reparation? For this requires that the offender suffer what he did, as that clause of the law says, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. For certainly it is possible for an offender to lose his eye by the severity of legal retaliation in as brief a time as he deprived another of his eye by the cruelty of his own lawlessness. But if scourging be a reasonable penalty for kissing another man's wife, is not the fault of an instant visited with long hours of atonement and the momentary delight punished with lasting pain? What shall we say of imprisonment? Must the criminal be confined only for so long a time as he spent on the offense for which he is committed? Or is not a penalty of many years' confinement imposed on the slave who has provoked his master with a word, or who has struck him with a blow that is quickly over? And as to damages, disgrace, exile, slavery, which are commonly inflicted so as to admit of no relaxation or pardon, do not these resemble eternal punishments in so far as this short life allows a resemblance? For they are not eternal only because the life in which they are endured is not eternal, and yet the crimes which are punished with these most protracted sufferings are perpetrated in a very brief space of time. 
nor is there any one who would suppose that the pains of punishment should occupy as short a time as the offence, or that murder, adultery, sacrilege, or any other crime should be measured, not by the enormity of the injury or wickedness, but by the length of time spent in its perpetration. Then, as to the award of death for any great crime, do the laws reckon the punishment to consist in the brief moment in which death is inflicted, or in this, that the offender is eternally banished from the society of the living? And just as the punishment of the first death cuts men off from this present mortal city, so does the punishment of the second death cut men off from that future immortal city." For as the laws of this present city do not provide for the executed criminal's return to it, so neither is he who is condemned to the second death recalled again to life everlasting. But if temporal sin is visited with eternal punishment, how then, they say, is that true which your Christ says, With the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again? and they do not observe that the same measure refers not to an equal space of time, but to the retribution of evil, or, in other words, to the law by which he who has done evil suffers evil. Besides, these words could be appropriately understood as referring to the matter of which our Lord was speaking when he used them, namely, judgments and condemnation. Thus, if he who unjustly judges and condemns is himself justly judged and condemned, he receives with the same measure, though not the same thing as he gave. For judgment he gave, and judgment he receives, though the judgment he gave was unjust, the judgment he receives just. Chapter 12 but eternal punishment seems hard and unjust to human perceptions, because in the weakness of our mortal condition there is wanting that highest and purest wisdom by which it can be perceived how great a wickedness was committed in that first transgression. The more enjoyment man found in God, the greater was his wickedness in abandoning him, and he who destroyed in himself a good which might have been eternal became worthy of eternal evil. Hence the whole mass of the human race is condemned, for he who at first gave entrance to sin has been punished with all his posterity who were in him as in a root, so that no one is exempt from this just and due punishment unless delivered by mercy and undeserved grace. And the human race is so apportioned that in some is displayed the efficacy of merciful grace, in the rest the efficacy of just retribution." for both could not be displayed in all, for if all had remained under the punishment of just condemnation, there would have been seen in no one the mercy of redeeming grace. And, on the other hand, if all had been transferred from darkness to light, the severity of retribution would have been manifested in none. But many more are left under punishment than are delivered from it, in order that it may thus be shown what was due to all." and, had it been inflicted on all, no one could justly have found fault with the justice of him who taketh vengeance. Whereas, in the deliverance of so many from that just award, there is cause to render the most cordial thanks to the gratuitous bounty of him who delivers. CHAPTER thirteen. The Platonists, indeed, while they maintain that no sins are unpunished, suppose that all punishment is administered for remedial purposes, be it inflicted by human or divine law, in this life or after death. For a man may be scatheless here, or, though punished, may yet not amend. Hence that passage of Virgil, where, when he had said of our earthly bodies and mortal members that our souls derive, Hence wild desires and groveling fears, and human laughter, human tears, immured in dungeon-seeming night, they look abroad, yet see no light. Goes on to say, Nay, when at last the life has fled, and left the body cold and dead, e'en then there passes not away the painful heritage of clay. Full many a long-contracted stain perforce must linger deep in grain. So penal sufferings they endure for ancient crime to make them pure. 
Some hang aloft in open view, For winds to pierce them through and through, While others purge their guilt deep dyed In burning fire or whelming tide. They who are of this opinion Would have all punishments after death To be purgatorial, And as the elements of air, fire, and water Are superior to earth, one or other of these may be the instrument of expiating and purging away the stain contracted by the contagion of earth. So Virgil hints at the air in the words, Some hang aloft for winds to pierce, at the water in whelming tide, and at fire in the expression in burning fire. For our part we recognize that even in this life some punishments are purgatorial, not indeed to those whose life is none the better, but rather the worse for them, but to those who are constrained by them to amend their life. All other punishments, whether temporal or eternal, inflicted as they are on every one by divine providence, are sent either on account of past sins, or of sins presently allowed in the life, or to exercise and reveal a man's graces. They may be inflicted by the instrumentality of bad men and angels as well as of the good. For even if any one suffers some hurt through another's wickedness or mistake, the man indeed sins whose ignorance or injustice does the harm, but God, who by his just though hidden judgment permits it to be done, sins not. But temporary punishments are suffered by some in this life only, by others after death, by others both now and then, but all of them before that last and strictest judgment. But of those who suffer temporary punishments after death, all are not doomed to those everlasting pains which are to follow that judgment. For to some, as we have already said, what is not remitted in this world is remitted in the next, that is, they are not punished with the eternal punishment of the world to come. CHAPTER fourteen. Quite exceptional are those who are not punished in this life, but only afterwards. Yet that there have been some who have reached the decrepitude of age without experiencing even the slightest sickness, and who have had uninterrupted enjoyment of life, I know both from report and from my own observation. However, the very life we mortals lead is itself all punishment, for it is all temptation, as the scriptures declare, where it is written, Is not the life of man upon earth a temptation? For ignorance is itself no slight punishment, or want of culture, which it is with justice thought so necessary to escape, that boys are compelled, under pain of severe punishment, to learn trades or letters, and the learning to which they are driven by punishment is itself so much of a punishment to them, that they sometimes prefer the pain that drives them to the pain to which they are driven by it. And who would not shrink from the alternative, and elect to die, if it were proposed to him either to suffer death, or to be again an infant? Our infancy indeed introducing us to this life, not with laughter, but with tears, seems unconsciously to predict the ills we are to encounter. Zoroaster alone is said to have laughed when he was born, and that unnatural omen portended no good to him. For he is said to have been the inventor of magical arts, though indeed they were unable to secure to him even the poor felicity of this present life against the assaults of his enemies. For himself king of the Bactrians, he was conquered by Ninus king of the Assyrians. In short, the words of Scripture, An heavy yoke is upon the sons of Adam, from the day that they go out of their mother's womb till the day that they return to the mother of all things. These words so infallibly find fulfillment that even the little ones, who by the labor of regeneration have been freed from the bond of original sin in which alone they were held, yet suffer many ills, and in some instances are even exposed to the assaults of evil spirits. But let us not for a moment suppose that this suffering is prejudicial to their future happiness, even though it has so increased as to sever soul from body, and to terminate their life in that early age. End of Book 21, Chapters 7-14
Recording by Darren L. Slider, Fort Worth, Texas, www.logoslibrary.org.